A word of warning, this episode contains strong language and descriptions of violence that some people may find upsetting. Gone Fishing, Part 5. Liar, Liar. May 24th, 1998. The man we're calling Martin has just been two days talking to police about his involvement in the rape and murder of 20-year-old Leah Stevens nine years earlier. But then, after an undocumented half hour in a police interview room with West Auckland detective Mark Franklin, he says he's ready to make a new statement. He says it wasn't just Leah's murder that he saw. He says that five days earlier, he was also a witness to the death of Dean Fuller Sands. And yes, says Martin, Dean Fuller Sands really was shot dead by Stephen Stone, just as police had believed. But he was also shot by four other men, including Martin. And another four or five people stood there watching. And this all happened at an address that might sound awfully familiar. 22 Larnock Road, the flat in Henderson that was home to Gail Maney. From Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Here's what Martin tells the police in that statement. And bear in mind that just like Neil, he will later change his mind about many details. He says he and Dean Fuller Sands had lived a few streets apart in Blockhouse Bay. They'd gone to the same high school. They hadn't been friends, but when they both started hanging out at Chaplin's, the K Road strip club, they recognised each other. They both fell in with the same dodgy crowd that revolved around K Road's parlours and strip clubs. This included Stephen Stone and Stone's friend Mark Henriksen. There was the Chaplin's DJ Neil and some of the working girls, including Leah Stevens. Once, Martin sold Dean a car stereo he'd just stolen from a car yard in Newmarket. They were good quality radio cassette decks. We're using an actor to read Martin's transcripts. I think I got $70 for it. Another time, he and Dean went on a burglary together in Penrose. There was me, Dean, Stephen Stone and Mark Henriksen. Martin says Dean was into marijuana. He was into fishing. He talked about going to Piha and Fatipu. He was a bit of a wheeler dealer and sometimes sold drugs. He was a friendly guy, easy to know. He didn't usually brag around people he didn't know. Martin tells the police that one afternoon in 1989, a bunch of the chaplain's folk are hanging out at a house in Larnock Road in Henderson. It's the home of a couple of the prostitutes they know from K Road Parlours, a blonde woman called Gail and a friend, Tanya. There's another woman there too, Sonia. Also present are Stone and Henriksen, Neil and Gail's little brother Colin. Then Dean Fuller Sands arrives at 22 Larnock Road in his burnt orange Hillman Avenger. Immediately, Stephen Stone starts having a go at him. The two are standing in the small garage underneath the house, and as an argument develops, the others gather round. Stone was accusing him of ripping off the girls. It was a very heated, yelling, confrontational type of scene. Dean was begging them to believe he hadn't ripped them off. Stone doesn't believe Dean and keeps yelling. He punches him four or five times. Dean fell to the ground. Dean was moaning and groaning. Stone pulled out the twenty-two pistol he carried from under his jacket. Next, says Martin, the blonde woman called Gail comes over and kicks Dean in the head as he lies on the ground, and then... Stephen Stone shot Dean three times. Martin is pretty sure Dean is dead straight away, but Stone passes the pistol around to all the men in the garage and tells them to shoot the body. Mark Henriksen shoots Dean twice, Colin shoots him once. The gun is now empty, so Stone takes it and reloads, then... He handed the gun to me and said, shoot him. I held the gun in my hand, I... I pointed it at Dean, and I hesitated. Stone said, fucking shoot him! Stone puts his hand over Martin's, forcing him to pull the trigger. The gun passes to Neil. Neil shot Dean as well. Eight shots, in a small suburban garage with an open door, late on a winter afternoon. It's around sundown. Dean's bullet-riddled body is lying at the back of the garage. Someone pulls the garage door shut, and everyone heads upstairs. Stone wanted to wait for a few hours when there was no one around so we could dump the body. 
After some time, Colin reverses a car into the garage. Stone, Gail, Tanya and Sonia lift Dean's body into the car boot. They had to slam the boot a few times because it wasn't closing. Martin says Dean's body is taken out and buried in bush near Pihai Beach on the west coast. Later, he'll say Muruai. It's a long night. Stone and Henriksen, Martin and Neil and Gail's brother Colin then drive Dean's Avenger and another car to Fotipu and leave the Avenger in the car park. But... By the time it got back, Tanya and Gail and Sonia were worried about their fingerprints being on the car. So, sometime later, after dawn, says Martin... He, Neil and Stone return to Fotipu, bring the Avenger back to Larnock Road, put it in the garage and wipe it down. Around mid-afternoon, they drive in convoy to Fotipu again and leave the Avenger in the car park a second time. Martin will be interviewed several more times after this, and just like Neil, he'll change his tune repeatedly. Some of those changes are trivial, but there are at least three that really matter. First, he'll eventually add Leah Stevens to the list of people who were in the Larnock Road garage on the Monday when Dean died. In fact, he'll say she stepped forward in Dean's defence when Stone pulled out the gun. You'll notice that this quite tidily restores a plausible motive for Stone killing Leah later that week. Second, Martin will revise his story to say that on the Saturday, rather than dying in a bedroom at Buchanan Street in Kingsland, Leah was actually driven to 22 Larnock Road and died on the bed in Tanya's bedroom. In other words, he's saying that both murders happened at Gail Maney's house. Martin justifies the switch of location by saying he got confused when police showed him the clip from Neil's video interview because Neil's the one who talks about Buchanan Street. Third, as we said before, Martin initially says they buried Dean at Piha, but he'll later say that it was at Muriwai, which is a 50 kilometre drive further north. A couple of months later, around July 1998, Martin and Neil each make their final statements to police. It's Neil's 10th and Martin's 7th, give or take. And funnily enough, many of the details of their stories have now converged. Neil, who in his first nine statements never mentioned seeing Dean's death or being at Larnock Road, now says yes, he was there with a crowd of people when Stone shot Dean. He says Leah was there. He says Stone ordered Mark Henriksen, Colin Martin and himself to shoot the body. I'd just seen a guy get shot and killed by this guy and then I was told to put a bullet in myself. Now, both Neil and Martin say Dean was buried at Muriwai. As for the death of Leah five days later, Neil and Martin have similar stories about being in a car with Stone, the pickup from Queen Street, a confrontation in a car park, and both say Leah's eventual rape and murder happens in a bedroom, while a small social gathering goes on in the lounge. But Neil, following in the footsteps of Martin, now relocates that bedroom from Buchanan Street in Kingsland to Larnock Road in Henderson. And we just drove off out of the car park and up the road and out to Henderson. They both agree that Stone ordered the two of them to get rid of Leah's body and they dumped her in the bush. Some small differences between their stories remain, even in these final statements. For instance, Neil reckons that after dumping Leah, he and Martin drove somewhere. And um, we pulled all the stuff out of the boot, the clothes, and the clothes and the bed stuff into a 44-gallon drum and, and burnt the lot. While Martin says... We wrapped up all of Leah's clothes and shoes in the bed cover and I walked over a little grass ridge and hid the bed cover and clothes under some shrubs. But all the same, their final statements, the ones they'll rely on when they're giving evidence in court, match up pretty well. And of course, you could draw more than one conclusion from that. Mark Franklin, the cop leading the investigation, is happy with the new evidence. It might have been bad luck for Neil when he ran into Stephen Stone at the periodic detention centre, but it was great luck for police. They'd already been looking for links between the Dean and Leah cases. What became obvious to me when we were researching the missing people is that a woman was murdered in the same week as Dean Fuller Sandys. We thought that was relevant, particularly because of the prostitution links, the Cairo, the, the general theme. So we started having a very, very good look at the Leah Stevens unsolved murder. And the more we looked at the Leah Stevens file, the more there started to become some links with Larnock Road. The evidence from Neil and Martin clears up several mysteries at once. The other witnesses 
um, Leah Stevens had never been talked about. She was right out of the frame. Uh, and it wasn't until these first two witnesses started coming forward and, and admitted to the killing of Dean Fuller Sandys in the garage, it was at that point they identified that Leah Stephen was, was also in the garage. And this all started to make sense because Dean Fuller Sandys had gone on the 21st of August um, and Leah had gone missing on later on that week on the 26th. Despite all their ducking and diving and changes of details, Franklin thinks the stories from Neil and Martin are fundamentally believable. These two people were heavily involved. On their own admission, they put a bullet into Dean Fuller Sandys. Now, no one in their right mind is going to admit to that if they didn't do it. So they admitted that. They admitted raping Leah Stevens. No one in their own mind is going to admit to raping someone if it didn't happen. So that's why this was so compelling. Gail Maney sees it very differently. She says Martin and Neil lied from start to finish. She's adamant that she never even met Neil or Martin before seeing them give evidence in court. I've got my theory and I believe that they really did have something to do with the disappearance of Leah Stevens because yeah. I've learned through the trial that they knew her previously and they both had sexual liaisons with her and they both used to frequent the Woodhall Forest um, and go bike riding. So I believe something went wrong there with those guys. If Stephen Stone had anything to do with them where they say that he helped them get rid of the body or anything like that, I can't say. Only Steve's the only one that knows that, but I know that there was never, like Dean Fuller Sandys, it just it didn't happen. I guess these two guys, they're going to say whatever because they've got a purpose to serve. They're going to, they want to get off with this murder conviction, so they'll do whatever it takes. To be fair, as police and the Crown prepare for the High Court trial that will finally start in March 1999, they aren't especially interested in Gail's denials or theories. Leaning heavily on the statements of Neil and Martin, they construct a new official narrative of events. Remember that when Gail and the others were arrested, the case was built on what we've called Scenario 1. A neighbour sees a burglary at Gail's house in Larnock Road. Gail decides the burglar was Dean Fuller Sands. She argues with Dean at the Westwood Ho pub and tells Stephen Stone she wants him killed. Stone does the job somewhere in the bush and then brings the body to Larnock Road to show Gail. Now though, the Crown version, let's call it Scenario 2, is much, much more complicated. In this version, the murder of Dean actually takes place at Larnock Road. Gail Maney is right in the thick of it, and according to Martin, is kicking Dean in the head just before Stone shoots him. There are eight or more eyewitnesses, and four of them actually shoot the body themselves. There are complicated car journeys to Muriwa and Fatipu to dispose of the body and make it look like Dean drowned. And then, five days later, there's a second murder to stop a witness from talking. Gail, Mark Henriksen and Colin Maney face much the same charges as before, but Stone is now being charged with rape and a second murder. One thing that seems kind of interesting though, is that Gail says she wasn't formally questioned about the new scenario. When I was initially charged, it was just the Dean Fuller Sandy scenario, and we'd had the depositions hearing, and then further down the track, almost over a year later, they threw in the Leah Stevens scenario, which I've never ever to this day been interviewed about, and they changed the scenario to Dean being murdered, allegedly murdered in the garage. I've never been interviewed with this new, with this change of events. So I. Yeah, I've never been questioned. It was just weird. I learned all about it when I went to trial. And I was trying to get my head around everything. And I sat there thinking, if I don't understand everything that's going on here or this whole story, how can the jury be understanding it? Because it was so confusing. Gail has a point. We're well aware that keeping track of all the shifting versions of the story can do your head in. But before we move on, we just need to briefly look at two other people whose stories also changed once police moved to scenario two. So 
Scenario 1 always depended heavily on the account of Gail Maney's old friend and ex-flatmate Tanya Wilson. To a lesser extent, it also depended on Gail's other flatmate, Sonia. At the first depositions hearing, both women said they were at Larnock Road when Stone turned up and showed Gail a body in a boot. But obviously, this is totally at odds with Scenario 2, where Dean actually dies at Larnock Road. But happily for police, Tanya and Sonia proved to be quite flexible in their recollections. They are re-interviewed and come up with new statements saying, ah oh, yes, actually, they did see an execution in a garage with many people present and with a gun passed around. Perhaps Tanya and Sonia were minimising their involvement at first and only had the full truth dragged out once police came back with new information. Or you might just think that they were willing to say whatever the police told them to back up Scenario 2. Whatever the case, it's clear that the evidence Tanya and Sonia presented at the first depositions hearing was untrue. They lied under oath. Mark Franklin is quite relaxed about the knowledge that his key witnesses were liars, because even liars do tell the truth under the right circumstances. People lie. Judges say this to, to juries. People lie for many reasons. I think what happened here is that we started with some information, put it to people, and they gave us the response they thought would satisfy us, but they had to respond to the facts we were putting to them. As we kept doing that, once the next story came, we challenged that and gave them reasons why things weren't stacking up. And this had the effect of actually putting pressure on these witnesses. We had to repeatedly go back to them. It got to the point where they knew they'd already implicated themselves to a certain degree, but we weren't happy until we got to as close to the truth as we possibly could. And I'm still not convinced that they all told the truth. We spent a lot of time looking in the Murawai forest for Dean Fuller Sandy's body. We never found the body. But I think we got, we got a long way there and certainly, in my view, um, sufficient for the convictions. We were kind of startled when Mark Franklin said this, that perhaps police didn't reach the complete truth about Dean and Leah. And isn't that the point of interviewing witnesses and getting a case ready for trial? I'm, I'm pretty sure near enough is good enough isn't the motto of the New Zealand courts. Exactly. Ever since Gail told me about her case, the reliability of all these witnesses always bothered me. And when I read the transcripts, it bothered me even more. I just thought, how could police even think they're getting close to the truth when their scenarios are built on all these layer after layer of lies? I mean, we've pointed out some of the diversions and U-turns in Martin and Neil's stories. But if you look closely at the statements of Tanya and Sonia, their stories duck and dive all over the place too. And there are good reasons to distrust the motives of these people. Neil and Martin, they've been implicated in horrible crimes that could see them go to jail for years. But the possibility of immunity is dangling there. That's some powerful motivation to tell the police what you think they want to hear. Tanya Wilson, someone with a long history of being in trouble with police, and she was also in a dispute over custody of her children. Perhaps she felt under pressure to give police what they wanted. And remember that thing that we've said right from the start. For the Dean Fuller Sands case, there is just no physical evidence. No weapon, no blood, no CCTV, no body. With Leah, there's a skeleton, but that's about it. Once Scenario 2 comes along, the police finally have two alleged crime scenes to look at. But blood and ballistics experts found nothing useful in the Larnock Road garage and bedroom. These witness statements are the only thing the police have to go on. Look at the big picture of who was allegedly there that Monday. According to the trial summary of facts, there were 10 people in the Larnock Road garage. Two of the 10 are now dead, Leah and Dean. Four of them give evidence and as a result are never prosecuted for anything. That's Neil, Martin, Tanya Wilson and Sonia. The remaining four who deny any of this ever happened all receive prison sentences. Stephen Stone, Gail Maney, Colin Maney and Mark Henriksen. Gail seems to be suggesting that police just made up a story and fed it to those four witnesses. Is that what you think too? Maybe not. Maybe it's more a case of tunnel vision. 
But reading the statements, you can see how all the stories gradually meet up. And I don't know if that always means you're getting closer to the truth. I mean, should we be surprised that Martin starts giving all these details about Leah's rape and murder that match Neil's? The police have just played him the video of Neil saying exactly the same things. We asked Franklin about this. When police showed Martin parts of Neil's ninth statement about Leah's rape and murder, didn't that contaminate Martin's own recollections? Franklin says, not at all. Sure, in an ideal world... The best way to interview people is to ask them open-ended questions without actually giving them anything. Then, depending on what their responses are, you can start cross-examining them to a certain extent in terms of, well, hang on, that's not what we know, and, and the story will then change. But if a witness or suspect is reluctant to tell the truth, Franklin says it's totally legitimate to jog their memory or apply pressure by showing them a transcript or recording of what someone else has already said. Standard police practice. Obviously, they were never interviewed together. One would come and be interviewed, we'd get that story. Then the other one would come in. It slowly stepped things up because we were entitled to put what one was saying to the other. And that's how it progressed. I still don't think that we had the perfect picture by any means. OK, but what about the Sunday afternoon when Martin starts talking about Dean for Lassans? He's been interviewed about nothing but Leah for two days. Then Franklin spends half an hour alone in a room with him. And suddenly he knows Dean for Lassans and has this story about a shooting in a garage. Just what happened in that room between Martin and Franklin? We're not the first people to give Franklin a hard time about this. He was cross-examined on this point at trial. But to our surprise, he tells us he doesn't exactly remember his half hour with Martin. Perhaps, just like those photos of Dean at Larnock Road that don't seem to exist, Franklin's memory has some gaps after 20 odd years. But we tell him, the police job sheet records are very clear on this. From 1300 to 1330 at Henderson Police Station on the 24th of May 1998, Franklin is alone in a room with Martin. I can't recall specifically what occurred, but if the evidence and the transcripts show that there was half an hour and I was in that room with this key witness, what I do want to say is that as an experienced police officer, I know how crucial it is to be extremely careful what said and done because that witness is going to be giving evidence on oath under cross-examination, and I'd be cutting my own throat if I did or said anything to that witness to jeopardise this case. I spent too long on building up this case. From what you've told me, okay, I accept I spoke to him, and I would have spoke to him in firm terms. I would have certainly mentioned the word truth, because that is what we're after. We're not after lies and, and exaggerations. We want the truth. If there's allegations that I pressured him or thumped him or uh, did something that was not correct, um, as I say, I, there's no point in me doing that because if I'd have done that, it jeopardises one of my key witnesses. He could have flip-flopped the other way and the whole case could have collapsed if I'd have put any threats or pressure. I mean, the police have clear rules of behaviour as to what they can and cannot do in an interview room. And you cannot use threats and compulsion, because it just renders any interview inadmissible. So, sure, I would have said to him, listen, we want the truth here, let's get this sorted out. But in terms of it going any further, absolutely not. But more generally, did Franklin pressure Martin into tying the Dean Fuller Sands and Leah Stevens cases together? After all, Martin and the cops were driving around in cars all the time, having unrecorded conversations. There was plenty of opportunity. I know this was a reasonably significant issue at the trial. Mm. It would be good for you to have a look at the transcript because there was four lots of legal counsel having a go at all, all of us. Well, not having a go at us, but it was an issue. Mm. But I retain what I said in court and what I'm telling you now is that it would have been fatal for us it could have blown the whole thing and there was no way I'm going to jeopardise this investigation by doing something as stupid as that. Or as he puts it later, if there was any suggestion that Martin was... Fair to name, then no, I totally dispute that because that was the thing I was looking for to give this case some grit. He emphasises the point. If the police had given this name, 
that would have totally diluted the strength of his evidence. And again. He spontaneously came out with Dean Fuller Sandy's name without us mentioning it. We deliberately withheld, we didn't want to know that, but he came out and said, this guy was shot in the garage at Larnett Road. Okay, these are actually quite curious responses from Franklin, because in fact, there are at least three times in police job sheets before Martin talks about the garage shooting, where police directly name Dean Fuller Sands in his presence. We've already mentioned a couple of them. Remember when Detective Sergeant Davy is on the phone to Martin making arrangements for him to come back to New Zealand? He says, Martin, do you know the name Dean Fuller Sands? And Martin says, no, it doesn't sound familiar. Then once Martin's back in Auckland, Davy asks him again, what can you tell me about the death of Dean Fuller Sands? And Martin replies, nothing. Am I meant to know this guy? And there's a third time we haven't mentioned before, noted on a police job sheet from the day Martin arrives in Auckland. This exchange comes before Martin has even admitted to seeing Leah's murder. Franklin says, Look, there was two murders in six days, Dean Fuller Sands and Leah Stevens. And Martin replies, Was I meant to be there at Dean's murder as well? And Franklin snaps back, You tell us. The thing I find weird about this is that the only reason Amy and I know that the police named Dean to Martin's face at least three times is because the police wrote that down in their own job sheets. In other words, this wasn't a hidden or furtive line of inquiry. And in any case, this is after the initial arrests for Dean's murder have already been widely reported. Anyone who'd read the paper would already know that a guy called Dean Fuller Sands was meant to have been murdered on August the 21st, 1989. And Martin moved overseas only very recently. So I'm kind of baffled that Franklin is so adamant with us about having not named Dean, when the police's own documents show he's got it wrong, and it's possibly no big deal anyway. Still, it was a long time ago, and Franklin no longer has access to any of the documents. He's just going by what he remembers. And like that thing about the photos of Dean at Larnack Road, it possibly doesn't mean anything. But it still struck us as odd. During our second interview with Franklin, we actually tell him we've double-checked the transcripts and that he seems to be mistaken about whether Martin was given Dean's name. He says... To be fair, if you've got the documents there and the transcript says that, then that's obviously what it is. So we ask again... Does this mean there was a danger that Martin was being led towards certain conclusions, or that his memories were contaminated by police name-dropping? Franklin just says he knew how important Martin was as a witness, so he wouldn't have been so stupid as to do anything improper with him. I guess all I can say there is that we simply do our investigations, we document everything, and that evidence is put to the jury, and the jury make a determination on that. We also asked Franklin how he felt about Neil and Martin's immunity. These guys confess to deep involvement in two murders and a rape, yet they get off scot-free. Franklin says immunity was a necessary evil. We didn't have forensics. We needed these witnesses. We needed to get them immunity. Much as I have to say we had to do that, it left a, a sour taste in my mouth because both of these men had offended horribly. And, you know, I hated seeing them get away with it. But I had one principal aim, and that was to get the, who I determined was the principal number one offender, and that was Stephen Stone. We wanted the big fish. These guys were smaller fish, they were responsible, but that was the only way we were going to get convictions. Okay, so I'm Nathan Blackwell. Um, That's not actually my real name. It's a pseudonym. We wanted a second opinion about those statements from Neil and Martin. So we showed transcripts to Nathan Blackwell, a former Auckland detective. I was in there for a decade, spent seven years as a detective in the CIB, and part of that was in the COVID arena. So I don't want to jeopardise any ongoing police work, so that was the reason for the pen Blackwell's name. a crime writer on the side. In fact, the name in this interview is also his pen name. Anyway, his view after reading the files? From the police's point of view, this would have been a really unusual case because... They were almost piecing together the investigation while they were interviewing these guys. So that's quite unique. Normally you would conduct the bare bones of an investigation, identify your suspects, 
And then the first time you interview them, you're already coming along with quite a lot of evidence and things to challenge them on. So this was slightly different in that these two people were interviewed quite early and the police themselves didn't really have a lot to go on. So the investigation is running in parallel with these interviews. Blackwell reckons those 10 interviews with Neil are almost like one giant interview broken into 10 pieces. Normally, you'd have all your facts ready to challenge what an interview subject says. Here, the police had to go and collect those facts at the same time. Neil and Martin are technically witnesses, but Blackwell says getting the information out of them is more like interviewing an uncooperative suspect. That'll be why Martin is shown chunks of Neil's interview. It is common practice to show one suspect the statement of another. With this case, uh, they showed him the video interview. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think it was very much to put more pressure. Okay, so sharing information is no big deal. But what about the endless succession of lies and the changing versions? Well, for Blackwell, that just smacks of somebody... ...that had some involvement, hasn't managed to unburden themselves of it. It's been, they've been dwelling on it for years and they want to get it off the chest. Therefore, his fears are legitimate that if he says too much, he's going to incriminate himself and probably end up in prison. And at the moment, he's not in prison. So he's got to be very careful about giving enough to unburden himself, but he doesn't want to give away so much that he goes to prison. Hence why his first few statements distance himself completely from everything. But he's trying to give enough for the police to kick something off. The problem with that is as soon as they kick it off, they're going to find out very quickly he was involved and they're going to keep coming back to him, which is exactly what they did. In other words, for Blackwell, the statements extracted from Neil and Martin look like excellent police work, rather than anything shady. As for the undocumented half hour between Franklin and Martin, sure. Police have to be very careful, of course, when they're interacting with a suspect, and for whatever reason, parts of that interaction go unrecorded. Today, that would be careless. But back in 1998... It probably wasn't viewed as such. So... Very much think D. Senior Franklin's intentions were, were pure and that he wanted to get the truth out of this person. However, what exactly happened that 30 minutes? Well, the only two people that know that are D. Senior Franklin and the person he was talking to. Blackwell does agree, though, that it's strange such a pivotal moment would have slipped Franklin's mind. Certainly a unique murder case such as this, talking with somebody that ends up being one of your primary witnesses. I would have thought that you'd remember the interaction, but then again, this was an investigation over a number of months. I mean, will you remember a single interaction? Who knows? For me, the late arrival of the Neil and Martin stories and the wrapping in of the Leah Stevens case just adds to my concern about the case against Gail Maney. There were already serious problems with the police timeline, including the huge issue of the neighbour's unbuilt house. But now there's an additional problem. The credibility of the four key witnesses. Mark Franklin defends the statements he got out of Neil and Martin. But look at those statements and ask yourself, are these guys liars or what? And Gail's friends, Tanya and Sonia, remember that they gave brand new statements as well, when the official story moved from Scenario 1 to Scenario 2. If their final statements are true, then their original statements supporting Scenario 1 simply must have been lies. These four liars are the pillars of the police case. That's got to be a problem. And for me, there's also another reason why I question Gail's conviction. Gail's own behaviour since her arrest. She's protested her innocence for 21 years. Her story never changes. Saying you're innocent doesn't make you innocent, but that unwavering clarity should probably count for something, right? And there's this. If she was guilty, or even just a little bit involved in Dean's death, she almost certainly could have sidestepped the world of pain that came her way. Those four lying witnesses... They all profess deep involvement in Dean's death, whether it was shooting a bullet into his body, bundling him into a boot, or helping dispose of his body. As Mark Franklin says, police were after the big fish, Stephen Stone, and they were ready to cut deals with the minnows. All Gail had to do was give the police something against Stone, just like Tanya Wilson and Sonia did, just like Neil did, just like Martin did. She could have been up in the witness box with them. 
Instead, she stuck to her guns and ended up in the dock with Stone. Gail Manny's insistence on her total innocence cost her the freedom that was being handed out freely to the others. Surely that fact alone means you have to pay some attention to what she has to say. With Scenario 2 in place, the machinery of New Zealand justice grinds back into gear and the four accused wait for the trial. Despite all the changes to the story of how Dean died, the case against Gail Maney changes less than you might expect. Essentially, she's still accused of asking Stephen Stone to kill Dean. Lurid accounts of guns being passed around her garage don't really change that. For Stephen Stone, though, the sudden switch from Scenario 1 to Scenario 2 has a far bigger impact. Before, he's facing just one murder charge. Now, it's two murders and a rape. On the 29th of April 1998, police inform Stone that they now believe he killed Leah Stevens as well as Dean Fuller Sands. The interviewing officer, Detective Ken Danby, invites him to confess. He says, this is your chance to clear up two homicides. Stone isn't interested. He says, go hard. Next time on Gone Fishing. Stephen was quite charismatic towards women, you know, like charming, and he'd always want to look after women and make sure that they were okay. No pupils. They're black. When you look at him, that was my abiding impression of him. His eyes were black. I mean, sure, he was only young, but um, even at a young age, you can't go around killing people. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poek, visuals by Jason Dore. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe.